So, uh, <coughs> today's topic, I consider myself to be an expert in. The doctor of love is what, no. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be, uh, you're already aware of this, but it's good to be reminded that the person standing up here is not a master, but a pupil of the stuff that they talk about. So, it's a very miserable position to be put in to come up on stage and to give a talk to your congregation. It's a, it's a blessing, but it's also a curse. <laughs> so you, you have to um, understand the, the conflicted mind of the person standing up here. Whether it's you or me, one day it's going to be you. <laughs> and in that moment, you have to have absolute, you know, you, you, have to, you have to believe that your audience is, is very empathetic towards your situation. So, our young people are getting ready to stand up here and give us a uh, service in a couple of weeks' time. And um, at that moment, we have to be very empathetic and uh, understand their situation from a artistic point of view and really encourage them to do that more often. So, uh, today's topic Love is a verb. Um, I gave this two years ago and uh, revamped it somewhat. So that was trial number one. This is trial number two. And um, so let's go. Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> so um, first of all, I wanted to ask, what is love? OK, what is our understanding of love? And we have uh, a noun definition, an intense feeling of deep affection. And we have a verb definition, which is to feel a deep romantic attachment to someone or something. However, these, um, these, uh, um, these definitions are still not quite adequate in, in my uh, understanding of this word. So when, we, when I talk about love being a verb, I'm talking about what's a verb, Maya? What's a verb? An action word. There you go. It's, an, it's a word that uh, describes an action. Okay? So, in this case, um, we go back to Jesus on the cross saying these words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we ask ourselves, how did Jesus feel when he spoke those words? Okay? Was he uh, feeling like this? I mean, it's, it's blasphemous, right, <laughs> what I'm saying here. You know, we, we all know Jesus' suffering and misery. Anyone who's familiar with the Bible stories of how Jesus uh, suffered on, the, on, on his way to the crucifixion understands the deep pain uh, that this man was inflicted with. And yet, in the moment of this incredible agony that he was suffering through, he was able to um, whisper or, or, or say uh, loud enough for someone to record them uh, these words. Okay, so these are very loving words. You know, Jesus is offering forgiveness in the midst of his pain and misery. So again, this action of loving, which is forgiving, is not spoken from a place of feeling terribly great about oneself or about one's situation. So, <coughs> so then we ask ourselves, <coughs> this is a, a verse from uh, Scott Peck. The person who truly loves does so because of a decision to love. This person has made a commitment to be loving, whether or not the loving feeling is present. If it is, so much the better. But if it isn't, the commitment to love, the will to love, still stands and is still exercised. And again, he uh, finishes off that section in the book with uh, true love is not a feeling by which we are overwhelmed. It is a committed, thoughtful decision. There's a, a book out called The Five Love Languages. Uh, I haven't read it. <laughs> but in my children, I recognize at least one of my children is a very touchy-feely type of person, and that particular individual 
expression of love for that individual is through hugs. Okay? Unfortunately for that particular child of mine, I'm not a hugger. <laughs> That's not my love language. Uh, when somebody comes up to me in a crowd and starts hugging me, I feel awkward. You know, I don't feel particularly loved. Now, many of you understand this because I'm sure in the audience today, some of you are huggers. You feel love through touch and, and emotional bonding, like the physical contact. And others of you are like more, you know, no, just give me some money or, you know, <laughs> show me some time, you know, um, and then I will feel loved. So that book is, is very interesting and it has an interesting concept. Of course, I've never read it, but um, it has an interesting idea that all of us receive love in a different way. So it might be a good idea for you to understand your love language and your spouse's love language so that you can communicate love to your spouse in a way that will be uh, received well by him or her. I thought that was a brilliant insight. Uh, I wanted to share with you this morning. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we love our spouses, we love our children, but how effective are we in communicating that love to them? Okay, are we communicating it in a way that can be received by them? Uh, in a loving way, or are they just annoyed by us? <laughs> Stop it! Because we all know that loving somebody um, is often not a particularly pleasant thing to do. I mean, um, think about what is what is what is it to what does it mean to love a person? Okay, what does it mean to love a person? Okay, um, my personal definition of Loving a person is to do something for them that will benefit them in a spiritual way. Okay, so you're doing something that's going to make them not just feel good, but it's going to be beneficial for their for the growth of their spirit. And that sometimes involves punishment, doesn't it? I mean, as a parent, we all understand that we can't just let our kids do whatever they want because it will not help their spiritual growth by doing so. So sometimes we put restrictions on them, we place curfews on them, we tell them when to do something or when not to do something, and often we get a bit of pushback, um, to say the least. Pushback, that's a nice way of putting it. Just a bit. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> and in the process of loving, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of frustration, and all we want to say as parents is, you'll thank me later. <laughs> you'll thank me later. Now later could be 20, 30 years down the road, so we have to be patient, but as parents we have to administer and give love sometimes that is not received very well. Okay, so, <clears throat> but what is the problem of love, essentially? The problem of love, essentially, is that we want to receive it more than we want to administer it, okay? And when we say receive it, we're talking about the fluffy, kumbaya, cloud-in-the-sky love, okay? We're talking about the good-feeling love. And how do we get that good-feeling love is, according to Eric Fromm, most people see the problem of love as the problem of being loved rather than to love, to be capable of loving. So therefore their biggest concern becomes how to make themselves more lovable rather than to make themselves more loving. So <clears throat> we um, dress in a certain way, we um, go to the gym to make ourselves, you know, to work on our waistline. Um, we work on our hair, we work on our skin, we work on, our, you know, we, we basically, you know, you know we, we might even be motivated to go get a job to make some money <laughs> to go buy a nice big house or a big car or whatever to make ourselves <clears throat> more lovable. Okay, this might be our, our focus. And we all know people like this, so, and uh, there's parts of that in us too. You know, we are really focused on making ourselves into lovable beings. 
and therefore we can be we can experience more love that way that's the kind of psychology that this world has um, <clears throat> do people prefer to give or to receive Reverend Moon asks the majority of people like to receive the fact that a person wants to receive is related to their desire to grow and become big how much you are able to put inside yourself determines how much you grow okay simple physical principle right people's lives are ruled and dictated by dependency needs the constant need to be loved and nurtured they are so busy seeking to be loved that they have no energy left to love they are like starving people it is as if within them they have an inner emptiness a bottomless pit crying out to be filled fill me with love but which can never be completely filled, unfortunately. And why is this? But before we ask that, you know, ask ourselves, is it wrong to want to receive? <coughs> no, right? I mean, we all want to receive love. Giving love, especially in the form of, you know, educational love or disciplinary love, is never a pleasant experience. I don't think anyone in their right mind wants to do that or enjoys doing that unless you're a sociopath but uh, wanting to receive this is something we all have a tendency to focus on I want to receive more love how do I get more love you know go around society with a straw <gasps> I need to suck more love into me how do I get more love you heard that song looking for love in all the wrong faces looking for love in all the wrong places well this is the problem, you know, we are looking for love from the outside in. Okay, so, we ask ourselves, <clears throat> if we only receive, going back to the physical principle, Reverend Sun Myung Moon, very practical guy, very down to earth. If we only receive, what happens? If we pour water into a glass that is already full to the brim, it spills over. That means it's time to give. And if you don't, the water gets wasted. Until we are mature, we all want to receive. But at a certain point, as we mature, the time comes to give. So, part three. How do we experience true love? Or how do we continue to experience true love? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Here's a clue. This is how we do it, Jesus said 2,000 years ago. And he was quoting Old, Old Testament scripture. So this knowledge on how to acquire love, on how to receive love, was already there. Those Jews are smart people. <laughs> well, who made them smart? God did. And their relationship with God is what raised them up to be very smart people. Um, but here, here, let's break this sentence down. It's got two parts. Part one, love God. Develop your re vertical relationship with God. Part two, love your neighbor. Develop your horizontal relationship with others. So part one is like <clears throat> you have this amazing equipment, which is a human being. Okay, imagine a, a human being as an amazing stereo. You know, it's got this incredible, like, bass sound and it's just stacked like high up like this and it's an incredible incredibly sophisticated machine capable of doing all kinds of things okay and here's the power cord okay and the power cord is our relationship and then God is what God is the outlet the power okay now if we don't plug that thing in how great can that machine be? It reminds me of another joke my English teacher told us, and he stretched this out over the course of 10 weeks. At the end of every English class, he would go back and forth, you know, walking up and down. In fact, we clocked him. He walked about five kilometers every class. Up and down, up and down. Anyway, he would talk about the spur lash machine. <coughs> And he would go into detail about how the, the spur lash machine was a, uh, a, a secret weapon developed by the Navy during the war. And it developed this huge monstrous box, you know, and then they took it out to the ocean 
and you know, the Spurlash machine was going to do this incredible thing, and then you know, you had about 50 men just push this thing over the side of the boat, and as it landed into the water, it went Spurlash. <laughs> And that was the joke. <laughs> Ten weeks in the making. <laughs> Can you imagine our disappointment? Oh my gosh, we thought this was going to be a, some fantastic joke. But anyway, the spur lash machine. I don't even know how it got to that. But anyway, <clears throat> love God. Develop your vertical relationship with God. Oh yeah, it's exactly right. So we have the big, you know, stereo Wi-Fi thing. Okay, that represents human beings with all this incredible potential. And then God represents the power. If we don't plug ourselves into God, what do we become? Spurlash machines. <laughs> Just capable of fulfilling a, a small portion of what we're capable of doing. Yeah, we can make a big spurlash, but that was not our original intention. We were created for so much more. But in order for us to realize that potential, we have to plug ourselves in. So Jesus is reminding us through quoting Old Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, love God first, love God, develop your relationship with God, and then when you've got that, you know, when you've re received the love of your parent, your heavenly parent, you, you've received the love of God through your parents, then you're in a position to start practicing love. Practicing love. As a kid, you start practicing love, practicing sharing, practicing giving, practicing sacrificing, <coughs> practicing chores, practicing your contribution to your family, practicing, practicing, practicing love. Okay, and then you run out of steam. Oh, it's a tough day. And then you receive love, and then you go out and you do it again. And in that process of developing your heart, your, your container, let's call it a container, just for want of a better description, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And what can you do with a bigger container is you can receive more love. Okay, so with a tiny little thimble cup, okay, which, <laughs> okay, give me love, give me love. You're pouring it full and there's nothing there. You can't feel anything anymore. Right? That's kind of our predicament, right? We don't give me love, you're not giving me enough love. It's because you've got nothing there to give it to. It's nothing. You can't receive it. Grow your heart. Practice some loving. Just start somewhere and just do something for others. And and yet, you know, our situation is we're so kind of wrapped up inside ourselves that we can't see the basic truth that the second part loving our neighbor needs to be administered. We need to love our neighbor as much as we can, as best as we can, and then we can develop our vertical relationship with God. It bears repeating, love the Lord your God, how? A little, 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 little bit of that. <laughs> it says no, with all your heart, as best as you can, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, all. Dump it all out. Leave it all out there on the field, as they say in sports. Okay? And then, love your neighbor as yourself. So, <clears throat> if you desire love, the secret of gaining it is to pour out yourself, your life, your love, your everything. You must remember the wonderful fact, this is a wonderful fact, by the way, <laughs> that love starts from sacrifice. <sighs> that word sacrifice. <laughs> <sighs> Giving of yourself. Oh, I have to give myself. Investing yourself. Your life, your everything, okay? This is the painful part, you know, because when we read this, we're like, ah, oh, I can't do that, you know? Sacrifice, really? That's a toxic word. <laughs> Not politically correct. To sacrifice yourself. But this is it. And then we are reminded again, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, daily, and follow me. If you really want true, unchanging love, you must realize that it is not going to be gained in a very relaxed fashion. You have to go to extremes, and there you will find it. Ouch. This is the part where we always fall down, right? And we're like, we fall down because we haven't worked on that first part yet. We're not intoxicated enough with God's love 
to care that much about the sacrificing part, the part where we do stuff for our fellow human beings. You know, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. Has anyone seen that movie Interstellar? <coughs> it's an interesting movie, very interesting movie. Brings up a lot of uh, cosmic questions. And one of them is that, you know, this guy who's been basically abandoned on a, on a planet, um, he makes the point that as human beings, we have learned to care about the people in our circle, but we haven't yet been able to really care that much for people out there in the world who are not directly related to us. And it's a good point. It's a good point. It's a very valid point. And uh, according to the principle, we overcome that when we become, when we recognize ourselves to be children of God. When we have that relationship with God as our parent, we understand God is our parent, then we start to see everybody in the world as our brother and sister, as, you know, our close relatives. So we haven't got to that point. Most of us haven't. I mean, maybe a few people have, like Mahatma Gandhi and Mother Teresa and, you know, but we haven't really gotten to that point. But um, going back to this, going to extremes. How many of us go to extremes for the sake of God? How many of us have able to really pour ourselves out for the sake of for the sake of uh, actualizing love. But if we do, once you have it, you will have unperturbed happiness even at the bottom of hell's misery. There's the prize, right there, there's the prize. Okay. Unperturbed happiness at the bottom of hell's misery. We ready for that? <laughs> but you know, Jesus reminds us. He says, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And um, my understanding of that verse is the sacrificial nature of love. So again, we're reminding, we have to remind ourselves, this is a wonderful fact. It's a wonderful fact. Is it? Is it a wonderful fact? <laughs> love begins with sacrifice. <laughs> ah, sacrifice? Really? Can't it begin with candy? <laughs> I would be so much more motivated if love began with a three-hour movie. Come on. No, you must remember the wonderful fact that love starts from sacrifice, emptying of yourself, giving of yourself, investing yourself, your life, your everything. Okay? True love comes into being when you practice the highest possible love in the lowest possible place. There, and we as parents, <laughs> you know this, you deal with impossible people. <laughs> And you try to raise them into the highest possible people by showing them the highest possible standard. Showing them, not telling them about it. Hey, follow that guy. See what he's doing? No, we have to show the standard. This is the hard part. <clears throat> showing the highest possible standard. <clears throat> that is where true love can be found and can start. And so, part three, I thought, the conclusion, rather, I thought, well, okay, let's just remind ourselves. Why do, we <laughs> why do we want this again? Why do we want to love? Why do we want all this sacrifice? Why do we want all this pain, in a way? Okay? And again, I am in the Father, the Father is in me. Your whole purpose for reaching the center is to meet the heart of God. That experience is so overwhelming and exciting that you cannot disappear there forever but must emerge again to embrace your family, society, the nation, and the world. Once the heart of God dwells within you, no matter how physically lonely you may be, you will be filled. If there is a center of love, then you can give love unselfishly and without limit, and you can become a subject of love. You must clearly understand the ideal world will start from you as an individual when you are one with God's love, which, can put, which you can put into practice in your daily life in human relationships. Love will start from you reaching out to all things as it originally started from God reaching out to you. So this is the principle of love as a verb. And um, 
So when we look at the Hollywood version of love and we think about all the implications of what it means and we understand that the reason why a lot of marriages break down is because people are being selfish in their relationships and they're just concerned about how they feel rather than the commitment to love or they've lost the reason why they want to love this person. <laughs> then, you know, we can understand how marriages and relationships can break down very easily when we forget what the center, what's at the center of that relationship. If you're both, if you're a husband and a wife and you're both heading in the same direction, even though you're at different places along that path, but if you're heading towards the same direction, then along the way you can meet, okay, you can meet each other and you can develop that horizontal relationship. But if you put different things at the center, you know, like um, if, if, the, if, if the woman wants to put, you know, true love at the center and then the man wants to put money at the center, then obviously those two things are not going to match up, okay? But money and harmony and true love and all those things can harmonize together if we put love at the center, God at the center, some common um, universal principle at the center of our relationships. So again, it's a question of plugging in, plugging into the power source. We can't really generate our own power. I mean, um, you, we can run on batteries for a while. The problem with batteries is batteries always run out and they need to be recharged. And that's what God is there for. God is our universal charging energy. <laughs> and so our job is really to plug in. And if we don't plug in, we do so at our own peril. Okay, we do so at our own demise. And we become a deflated person who cannot <clears throat> really have much to offer the people in their life. And that's kind of not just a self-destructive situation, but it's a destructive situation for the people around you. So, um, to finish off with, I wanted to just read this uh, poem written by the founder. And uh, this was written when he was 16, and he was questioning, how does this love thing work? This is excruciating, you know? How does this work? And then, at the end of the poem, <coughs> this um, young man, 16 at the time, realizes, ah, this is how love works. I see, you know. But he asks the question, have you done these things? Have you done these things? This is what I'm trying to do. Have you done these things? And if you have, then, oh my gosh, then you are the king of love. I'm going to give you the crown of glory because if you think about the restoration of history, we understand this is God's situation. God is the parent who is not loving us for his own benefit, right? If God was loving us for his own sense of goodwill and feeling, he would have dumped us a long time ago. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, how much have we given to God? How much joy and, and you know, wonderful you know, things have we given to God? So this is something that we need to think about in our relationship with God as a parent, a loving parent looking at us. We are the children. We are receiving all this love. Let's think about returning or reciprocating with it, okay? This is what God ultimately wants. So, Crown of Glory, part one, because it's, it's a poem that wouldn't fit all on there. When I doubt people, I feel pain. When I judge people, it is unbearable. When I hate people, there is no value to my existence. Yet, if I believe, I am deceived. If I love, I am betrayed. Suffering and grieving tonight, my head in my hands. Am I wrong? Yes, I am wrong. Even though we are deceived, still believe. Though we are betrayed, still forgive. Love completely, even those who hate you. Wipe your tears away and welcome with a smile those who know nothing but deceit and those who betray without regret. O oh Master, the pain of loving, look at my hands. Place your hand on my chest. My heart is bursting such agony. But when I love those who acted against me, I brought victory. 
If you have done the same things, I will give you the crown of glory. So, we know at 16 years of age, this young man hadn't yet understood the full implications of what was about to unfold. And uh, if you don't know the story, I urge you to look into it, the story of our founder. But basically, to cut a long story short, the understanding or the realization that Reverend Moon came across was our heavenly parent <coughs> is heartbroken since the fall, since being betrayed, and wants his children back and has been doing everything in his power to do that. And it is our part of the equation, if you like, to reciprocate, to understand, and to work with our Heavenly Parent to realize the ideal of creation. So again, this is why we do what we do. This is why it's important to learn how to love. This is why it's important to love. This is why it's important to reach out to God and to reach out to your neighbor and to practice loving, to make a bigger vessel for yourself, to be able to receive more love, to be able to give more love, to widen your vessel still further, to be able to receive more love, to be able to give more love, to become a person of love, basically. And uh, that path is not an easy one. It's a very difficult one. It's a very thorny one. Uh, it's been described as a razor's edge. Uh, lots and lots of uh, different descriptions you can find in religious texts from all different religions. It's a difficult path, but it's worth it. It's worth it because this is the ultimate prize. Okay? So thank you very much, and please join me in prayer. Heavenly parents, thank you so much for uh, bringing us into this world. And uh, it's a world where there's many, many problems. And we look at ourselves, and we are mixed up in the problems as well. And we really need you to guide us, to help us to understand our predicament and to give us a path that we can follow, a textbook that we can understand that will help guide us out of this quagmire, this uh, ridiculous situation that many of us find ourselves in, so that we can plot our course back towards you, collectively and as individuals. Please guide us today and throughout this next coming week. Help us to make wise decisions. Help us to reach out to you. Help us to understand that you are not toxic, that you enjoy a relationship just like all of us enjoy relationships. And we want to build that relationship with you and understand deep in our hearts that we are valuable to you, so precious to you, and on that foundation, I hope that all of us can develop that relationship and move forward in our lives. I'd like to offer this prayer through Christ our Lord and through our true parents. Amen. Uh, please spend some time connecting with your neighbor. This is part two. After you've <laughs> endured the Sunday sermon, now... It's time to practice a little bit of sharing. Thank you very much.